good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, so as Daniela said, I'm Chila Zigrin. I'm VP of Strategy at uh, an enterprise blockchain uh, startup called BTP. I'm also a former technology industry analyst, and I have the pleasure to moderate this panel. I think uh, it's fair to say that the last time we saw each other in person in Phoenix, uh, we have uh, seen an acceleration in the adoption of distributed ledgers and associated technologies in the enterprise space. But at the same time, uh, we have also seen the, or witnessed the demise of some, of some pretty ambitious initiatives. So our panelists here have been working with DLT for uh, uh, many years now, I think, and apply the technology to you know, wider uh, use cases uh, in different industries, and uh, we're going to share their experiences with us. And why don't we start, before doing that, why don't we start with you know, uh, some, uh, a round of uh, brief introductions? Um, sure. Uh, Rob Polatnik, uh, I'm Managing Director and our lead uh, DTCC's Technology Research and Innovation Department. Uh, for those of you who do not know DTCC, we're uh, one of the um, critical financial post-trade processing service providers uh, in the United States uh, for pretty much all equity and fixed income transactions. We provide a variety of global swap repository services uh, for global trade reporting. Uh, and um, uh, we've been very focused on figuring out how an incumbent consortia like DTCC that's been around for 50 years can look forward and say, what do we need to do to innovate uh, to bring our entire industry along with us? Because we've heard and we'll hear how hard it is to create consortia. We have that obligation to help the industry move forward with this key technology. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm Bob Kruger. I'm the chief architect for Allianz Technology, which is the captive shared service provider for the Allianz Group, which is life and health insurance, which is um, P&C, uh, specialty insurance and asset management with the likes of Global Investors and PIMCO as well. So we've got a, a fair range of, um, of technologies that we build for our group and supporting our customers. Um, I'm also the Global Head of Blockchain for Allianz Group and um, I've been, we've been working on, on this since, um, since I joined in 2018, but obviously for longer than that. Um, we've got some really good use cases that we are driving into production and that's about getting yeah, real, real business for our, for, our, for our companies, real business value for them. So um, working really hard and looking forward to, to deploying more. Thanks, Bob. Hi, everyone. My name's Chris Pilling. And as Daniela mentioned, Fujitsu is proud to be a, a founding member of the Hyperledger project. And for the last five years, I've been part of the, the the business unit and the team within Fujitsu, along with colleagues like Shingo from Japan, who's here with me today, to, to really build a, a business that, that is allowing customers to talk to us and very quickly identify, have I got a use case for blockchain? And if it has, how quickly can we take it from thinking about business requirements to actually delivering something that we can deploy that brings a business process to life? It, it, very much with a focus because of the blockchain element with an ecosystem or a consortium feel and, and um, business architecture to it. Um, so that's me. Thank you so much. So let's dig into the blockchain in action. Uh, why don't you uh, share your thoughts on the, the state of the enterprise DLT in general and also maybe the, some industry specific progress that you're seeing? Sure. Um, from the state of the industry, uh, there's probably, and uh, Daniela listed a, a set of industries, uh, and in our involvement with Hyperledger and in my role as uh, a chair for the previous three years of the board, uh, I don't know that there's any industry I've encountered, whether it's certainly financial services, healthcare, music, energy, um, uh, airline parts. There's literally no business that I've encountered that hasn't had some discussion or there's not innovation from fintechs and uh, the core business leaders in that, that particular industry using blockchain and distributed ledger technology. And Hyperledger is always among the top uh, contenders in that conversation. Uh, inside of DTCC, as I mentioned, we're working with the entire financial industry on what the right opportunities are and the right use cases. We're actually live as of uh, two months ago with our first uh, DLT application that's running as part of one of our core processing systems. 
Uh, we're planning to go live with a second DLT system in October that replaces a mainframe um, application. Uh, we're in the middle of development of a third opportunity with uh, DLT. Uh, that's a brand new business service for DTCC and is leveraging a, a Hyperledger component. Uh, we're working with the Digital Dollar Project and Accenture on uh, uh, validating uh, central bank digital currency models, and we've worked on a prototype with them, uh, the first wholesale prototype, and we're going to be coming out with a white paper on that soon. Uh, and we're working on three other opportunities with our industry partners on you know, leveraging DLT for that opportunity that says it makes sense to use DLT. It's a multi-party workflow. It's a shared version of the truth. Uh, and how do we bring all of that together in the role that DTCC as a consortium can help do for the entire industry? Cheers. Um, so at Allianz, we've been working um, in terms of the industry, pushing forward sort of use cases around claims, around onboarding, um, asset management, and, and the like. Um, we have a, f for the industry, we have a, a product live now for over a year and a half, um, our international claim settlement. So. If you take your car for a drive across Europe and you're unfortunate enough to meet uh, an accident uh, somewhere in Italy, for example, um, Allianz Italy has to solve and settle all of that claim in situ, but there's lots of paperwork to do to, to reprocess that claim back to your, your country of origin, like the UK or Ireland or, or Germany. And um, so we've been running that for about, uh, about a year and a half. We're, it's like, like the F merge where we're counting down to our two millionth transaction um, in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and it's been uh, revolutionary for us. It really has. It's the, 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 you know, we've been really focusing on where we get business value for the organization. We've set a very high bar, like that, that product now administers hundreds of millions of euros across, across Europe in 25 countries and, and settling tens of thousands of claims. And um, we, we, we made a rod for our own back, of course, with the bosses. Like, so every new product now has to deliver at least double digit millions in savings. So, um, we're really putting it to work uh, for us, and, and Hyperledger Fabric is one of our, our two reference architectures that's gone through our, all of our group's security standards. You know, we've got its claims information, remember, so it has to be GDPR compliant and so on. So the industry and, and the, the enterprise is really focusing now on, on business value. Experimentation is less talked about. It's more about real production use cases for us, and, and that's, uh, that's where we see it going. And we've built on DLT to enable us to go wider into, into the enterprise. So other enterprises, so, you know, car crashes mean repair shops. So, you know, expanding into that, that broader network, that network of networks, if you like. And, um, and that's why it's so important, DLT, because it enables those networks then to connect to each other. And, and that's why, you know, one of our founding principles for, for building on DLT was to enable those networks. And it's, uh, it's, it's still early. <laughs> I would say for enterprise, but I think we're, we're really starting to make progress now in real value. And for me, if I think about the, the state of the world or the state of the, the, the industry now, one big thing I'm noticing is, whereas previously we'd sit down with the customer and they'd bring a list of technical requirements, we sit down with customers now, and, and Melanie really touched on many points around this. We're, we're at this pivotal stage now where customers sit down with us and bring a list of business requirements. And, and technology is almost, you know, pushed to, the, to, to, to a secondary discussion. So specifically around Hyperledger Fabric, the, the maturity of the product, the strength of the product and, and the use cases that we can now show to a customer, give us that entry point into talking to business stakeholders, maybe even the board level members of a, of a customer, because they just know that we've got a tool set with Hyperledger Fabric and, and Shingo, my colleague is working heavily on Cactus. You know, we've got this tool set that just lets us focus very precisely on business requirements. And, and because of, high, you know, as I say, the, the Hyperledger Fabric momentum is giving us that opportunity. And, and that for me is, is a really pivotal in, in terms of the state of the industry. Mentioned Hyperledger Fabric, but beyond Hyperledger Fabric, what are those other Hyperledger technologies that uh, you are using? Why are you using that, and for what kind of uh, use cases? Um, we're we're just solid on, on Fabric. We want to get real value up and running, and um, you know, the deploying on the latest versions. Like we're on two two point three point two at the minute, 
but really making use of all of those new features and functions that are coming from, from Fabric itself to, for real business value. And that's our focus at the minute. We're looking at identity and um, Aroa a little bit, um, but that's something that, we're, that, that is our experimentation, if you like, for, for self-sovereign identity. And, and for us at Fujitsu, it, it's, it's, we, we've grown our business out of um, Hyperledger Fabric. Um, we've got a use case that uses Beisu, very successful use case, and that, that's got the potential to grow very big in the near future. Um, my colleague Singo um, is focused heavily on Cactus. We've got a project signed now. We, we've got a real life project underway where we're going to use Cactus to, to allow interoperability between different chains, of course for a really exciting microfinancing project with a global footprint through our uh, botanical water customer. Um, so we're, we're really looking at the, the, the wider portfolio of Hyperledger. I'm personally very focused on, on some SSI type use cases for, for UK government, and, and that automatically brings a, an opportunity for, for Indy and that little ecosystem around Indy for, for SSI use cases. So. Um, we, we're really looking to use as much of the portfolio as we can. We're, we're using uh, Bezu in one of our development projects. Uh, where we're looking at Indian Aries as part of our, uh, some of our SSI and identity initiatives, and we've been looking at Cactus and some of the other things uh, for interoperability. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So now uh, let's um, talk a little bit about the challenges that you're facing, the pain points that well, either you and your teams have, your customers have, and also maybe a little bit of lessons learned from uh, oh, sorry. lessons learned from from projects that did not make it. Sure, um, I'm, I'll give that a start. So first, uh, and at the top of the stack for probably everybody is business case, and making sure that you you have the right fit, and it's not just a hammer and everything's a nail. Uh, I think we've moved well beyond that, and and it becomes uh, kind of a narrower. Is there is there uh, enough criteria that this is a multi-party workflow, that this is a shared version of the truth, uh, that there are, are di enough different parties that would benefit from, from distributed ledger that it makes sense. Uh, one of the interesting things that we're seeing uh, is governance. Once you have multiple parties involved, uh, you run into the entire issue of what are the, the standards going to be, how a firm is going to adopt a node if they, if they want to adopt a node. Uh, what we're seeing is it's a mix of firms wanting nodes, firms wanting us to host a node, firms wanting an API, or firms not wanting to change at all. Um, so there's, there's that level. At the tech side, there's upstream and downstream systems. DLT does not stand alone. It integrates with other parts of your ecosystem. Uh, so you have to figure out what those integration points are and where they, they'll, they'll meet your resiliency requirements, your scale requirements, your performance requirements, your, your, your boundary security conditions. Uh, integrating with your internal stack, your CI/CD pipeline, how does Solidity and uh, Kotlin and other languages fit into your CI/CD pipeline uh, for versioning, for, for code review and code scanning, uh, and skills. Uh, you know, if you start using lots of different ledgers and lots of different uh, uh, languages and lots of different ecosystems, you're going to have to develop lots of different skills. Uh, so we've been building out a whole DLT curriculum to bring skilling up to, to uh, inside of DTCC from business to tech, uh, and we're actively recruiting, so please send your resume. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the first questions, like as I, we, I, I said previously, it's early, one of the first questions I get asked is like, oh, we're building a blockchain, is that not gonna kill the environment? Like, you know, Allianz, we're, mm -hmm. we're sort of, we're, we're at leading at the COP26, for example, for net zero, and that's the first question I get asked. It was like, so, when we, when we released to production, I also had to release to production my a sustainability paper alongside it to say, our Hyperledger Fabric deployment is using one, one in 800 million times less energy per transaction than the Bitcoin blockchain, and provable mathematics and so on to do that. And that was really important for us because you know, when we look at it um, for like green IT and, it's, and to be more than just you know, paperware or, or, or you know, just sort of greenwashing, we need to be able to prove that we're using languages that consume less energy in the microservices like Golang and say to Java and so on. So um, sustainability is a big issue for us, especially, you know, especially after all of our, uh, all of our sort of announcements on, on the ESG frameworks and so on. So we have to live, you know, we have to live it in our technology deployment. So that's a big, that's, that's always a, a first question for us. And then of course, um, yeah, getting it, to, getting it to go live, like getting, you know, one entity to go live with a new product that really solves a problem is hard enough. Getting 25 to go live on the same day 
Um, and then, you know, and close down our old monolithic application on the same weekend and migrate across 15 years of claims. You know, uh, you know when you have a car accident, sometimes a claim can last 20 years mm -hmm. if you've got health care and so on to pay. And so all of those claims have to come over successfully. So that migration and, as you said, like the nuts and bolts of, of app application development, you know, how you, how you set up your stack and so on. You know, these are the, the real challenges. But as, as Chris said, business case is everything. You know, it has to be. It has to start paying. We've, we, we, we've, we're past the time of throwing blockchain at every problem and yeah. seeing what fits. Yeah. Now, I would echo um, both Bob and, and Robert in that the, the biggest challenge we face in terms of products, uh, sorry, project deployment or project um, envisioning is, is the integration. And the moment that I say to a customer, what are we integrating with? You sometimes even get maybe even a blank expression. What, what do you mean integrate? And, and one of our mantras at Fujitsu is, as Robert said, blockchain is never a standalone solution. It's never a standalone entity. And, and that's when you get into the real nitty gritty of, you know, where you need to integrate with this and that. And well, and sometimes the answer is we don't know what we need to integrate with. We know we've got this data somewhere and, and that's where the real kind of hard work starts. Absolutely. I think we have, oh yes, we still have a, a few minutes. Um, so now the, the crystal ball question, <laughs> we finish this off with. Uh, so what does the future look like? And I mean the future in terms of you know, the technology itself and the, because it's, again, it's not just one technology but all the associated technologies. So what's the future like with that? What is the future with the adoption of it all? And also uh, what can the Hyperledger uh, Foundation do uh, to you know, stay relevant? In, in the upcoming years. Oh, that's, Sorry, that's, there are three questions. <laughs> but uh, we have like seven, eight minutes. So the first one, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Nobody said it yet, which surprises me. Um, so I'll be the first one to sell this, this bad deadline. Uh, but you know, two and a half years um, in, in Phoenix, uh, drinking a Corona, who could have imagined that in two and a half years you could be drinking Guinness? What an evolution! So, so sitting where we are today with with Hyperledger um, uh, at at this conference and pro pushing out another two and a half years, uh, uh, and considering you know two and a half years ago it was POCs, pilots, we're moving past this, we're moving past that, but there was very little you could point at. Today, almost every other week, you're reading about a production application, not just uh, I, we tried out a bond between three different firms and it was successful and then you, you never hear about it again. Uh, we're, we're live. We're going live with another one in a few months. Uh, we know some of our partners in the industry, some of our clients, some of our peers that provide our services in Europe, in Asia, uh, have gone live. We know when, and we've, we heard about the, uh, the project in Cambodia uh, that, that is live with central bank digital currency. Uh, and in other parts of the world, they're, they're moving forward on that. So things are going to go live, and people are going to learn and experience from those successes and those failures. Uh, one thing we, we're fairly certain is that uh, none of our client firms want to adopt uh, 10,000 nodes. Um, I, I think coming up with 10,000 different solutions across the industry is, is across one industry or multiple industries, and many of our industries are interconnected. Nobody wants thousands of nodes. Nobody wants to manage thousands of keychains. Nobody wants to manage thousands of different protocols uh, and ecosystems. Uh, and nobody wants to hire thousands of different you know, skill sets. Uh, it's just untenable. So somewhere it has to come together. The thing we loved about Hyperledger from its founding day, and we were founding members. Uh, I hosted, we hosted the very first startup, as it's been referenced, uh, very first meetup of, DT of, of Hyperledger at DTCC's Jersey City, and getting people to come to Jersey City is no easy task in the U.S. I don't know what the equivalent is in this country, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave that town. Aside. Probably Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, we, in, in the first month of 2016, we hosted all parts, and the beauty of that was the conversation, the fact that the dialogue in Hyperledger is, is completely open. It is the center of gravity of conversation across the industry. It has components up and down the stack, and it's got almost half a dozen technology stacks. It's got Fabric, it's got Bezu, Aroha, it's got Indy, it's got 
stacks that connect only in permission networks, connect, stacks that connect to some of the public networks. We're not an organization like some of the others that have kind of this trial out there. You, you could use the open source, but it's really scaled down and it's really limited. You really have to go to the commercial version. There's no conflicts of interest in Hyperledger. Our goal is an open conversation and bringing all parts of the community together. And this is the only place where we can solve that problem of interoperability and really solve that problem for the industry's benefit, for every industry's benefit of a cohesive set of standards and set of models and set of reference architectures that make sense for everyone. So the crystal ball says we're going to make progress along that front. There's not only going to be DLT projects, but there are going to be linked DLT projects. And whether that's using central bank digital currency to settle wholesale security movement uh, or, or pay uh, for, for Allianz. I'm going on a trip. I'm going to reserve a, a plane ticket on, on a blockchain solution with my payment on the solution. And I'm going to buy insurance for that same solution. So hopefully we see these pieces coming together. Yeah, Bob? Um, you know, for us, we've taken the decision to take blockchain and DLT out of the innovation lab. It now sits in our, in our core technology division. It has to stand on its own two feet. And I think that's, for me, that's the future, is, is DLT as, a, as part of a, an overall technology stack choice. Like our solution, that only, you know, blockchain sits at the middle with three smart contracts. The rest is nice front ends, U, UX. Um, databases on the back is a GDPR compliance. It's very important for us as a, a, in a regulated industry. And I think if we look into the future for, for what it holds is, you know, in, in my slide deck to my, to my superiors, it's like when CBDC becomes a reality, then we really start to see the engine, the engine motor here, I think, because we can tie pay, payment settlement on, on Ledger to those, to those claim settlements, for example. We don't have to off, you know, off chain that to, to a, 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 an SAP Ledger, for example. Yeah, so I think that's the real future. Once we can settle up on Ledger, that'll be a real kicker for us, and certainly in the financial services industry. Um, I look at my own organization, the conversations we were having around insurance use cases in 2018, those same conversations are now happening in the, in the asset management divisions of the company. So their thinking is now at, at that spot and it'll be a much faster adoption. So I see you know, asset management use cases getting deployed at scale and we're, you know, I'm talking, if we're talking hundreds of millions for, for claims, you're talking you know, 10, 100 times that in the asset management world, which will be real drivers for, for efficiency and for, for gains for our company and for the, for the whole enterprise. So that's where I see it going in, 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 the, in the future. Some last words, Chris. And, and for me, with that, that crystal ball view is that we'll even maybe get to a point in the near future where we stop identifying or, or talking specifically about the blockchain because it's, it's become so integrated into the ecosystem. We get to a point where you know, people will say, well, well, of course we use blockchain. How else would we record transactions? Of course we've got blockchain. How else would I pay for the the policy from Allianz with my favorite token without blockchain, of course it's there. And we get to that point where it, it's just so embedded that we stop talking about it. It, it's, it just exists because it needs to exist. That's what I'm hoping for in the very near future. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for sharing your experiences, your knowledge, and I hope this was useful for the audience. And um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.